History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 439th episode of the History Goes Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, we had a wonderful vacation, which is why we didn't have an episode of the regular podcast in the feed or a paranormal conversation. And as people can hear, I came back with a cold. You certainly did. So you'll have to excuse my voice. But the good news is the bulk of this episode is an interview that we already conducted. That is the good news. On this episode, we're going to be talking about the historic Scott County Jail in Huntsville, Tennessee. Lots of hauntings going on here. Yeah, I definitely want to get there one day. Before we get into talking about that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Taylor, Aaron with an E, Jane, Danica, Amy, Flacco. We have two Christines, one with a C-H and the other with a K, Samantha, Stephen, whose last name is King, but he's not that Stephen King. <laughs> But he's a star in our eyes. Most certainly. Jenny with a Y, Kathy with a K, Cricket, you know I love that name. Yes, indeed. His name of one of the characters in my book. Larn, Shauna, Pamela, Melinda, Alina, and Marie. Thank you for joining us in our Facebook group. And now this moment, Oddity. The moment in oddity was suggested by Chelsea Flowers. There's a factory worker who spent 50 years of his life filling a garden with otherworldly sculptures. Veho Ronkinen was a recluse who worked in a paper mill but spent his free time on his farm in a Finnish forest. As it's told, he wasn't a people person. Diane and I can relate. And he never studied art. But at the time of his death in 2010, he had covered his land with 550 sculptures. Many believe Vejo's artwork was his way of communicating with the world. Once he received his first paycheck at the mill, it is said that he purchased apple seedlings and concrete. This is where his first artistic garden creations were born. His garden draws 25,000 visitors annually. Although many describe it as eerie, we'd venture to guess that our listeners would describe it in more provocative ways. Some of these sculptures have the interesting addition of actual human teeth, along with speakers buried within their frozen-in-time bodies, which emit sounds some of us would relate to a Class C EVP. Clearly, this artist was a great observer of humanity, even if he preferred to sculpt instead of interact with others. It's said that his sculptures represent his exploration of self, but also what he viewed of the world. Regardless, adding human teeth to several human sculptures certainly is odd. This history podcast is haunted. And now, this month in history. In the month of June, on the 4th in 1783, the first sustained untethered flight occurred as a hot air balloon was launched in Annonay, France. Brothers Joseph and Jacques Montgolfier were the inventors of the first practical hot air balloon. They had discovered that heated air contained within a paper or lightweight cloth bag caused the bag to float into the air. The brothers made their first public demonstration of this discovery on the 4th at a marketplace in Annonay. They created the heated air by burning straw and wool under the opening of the bag, which rose to a height of 3,000 feet, and hovered for about 10 minutes before floating towards Earth about 1.5 miles from its point of origination. 
This experiment expanded in following months to include their first passengers of a sheep, rooster, and duck, which took flight for approximately eight minutes, landing safely about two miles away. Shortly thereafter, their first untethered manned flight sailed over Paris for 5.5 miles in about 25 minutes. The historic Scott County Jail is located in Huntsville, Tennessee. The jail is nearly 120 years old and housed inmates until 2008. Huntsville is a small town and the jail isn't very substantial, but the stories about this place are big. On this episode, we're joined by Dr. Christy Sumner, founder of Soul Sisters Paranormal and History, Highways, and Haunts, LLC. She and her business partner, Miranda Young, a.k.a. Ghost Biker, run tours, events, and ghost hunts at the jail. And Christy shares the history and many of the unexplained things that have happened in the jail. Huntsville, Tennessee is located on the Cumberland Plateau in northeast Tennessee. This is home of the Cumberland Mountains and the Big South Fork National River and Recreation Area. 25 acres of land purchased from George McDonald and Emmanuel Phillips gave Huntsville its meager beginning. 47 lots were platted out and the first courthouse and jail were built in 1851. The name is in honor of hunting, either for the long hunters who once lived in the area or a hunter named Hunt. They're not sure which of those is true. (laughs) Okay. By the early 1900s, Huntsville had its own newspaper, three hotels, four stores, a feed store, two blacksmith shops, a woodworking shop, a meat market, a lumber yard, a bank, and a small public park. Despite being founded in 1850, the town wasn't incorporated until 1965. Oh my goodness. I've never heard of a town being around that long before. It was all, it was over 100 years right. since its founding and it finally got incorporated. That's bizarre. Yeah. A courthouse square was built in 1906 and included a courthouse, First National Bank, and a county jail, all built from the native beige-colored sandstone. That jail was added to the National Register of Historic Places and is known today as the Old Scott County Jail. The Old Scott County Jail was used until 2008 when a new justice center was built across town. The jail sat abandoned until 2017 when the Huntsville mayor, Dennis Jeffers, petitioned the Scott County Commission to transfer the ownership of the jail to the town of Huntsville. The town of Huntsville received a $50,000 tourism enhancement grant from the state of Tennessee and restoration work began. This jail is a very personal project for many people, the mayor being one of them. His mother learned to cook biscuits and gravy from the wife of a former sheriff in the old jail's kitchen. This building also became a personal project for Dr. Christy Sumner. Christy has a PhD in public affairs with an emphasis on criminal justice and has spent some time as a college professor in Colorado and Florida. She speaks with authority on a number of subjects, which lends credence to her presentations of unexplainable evidence. And she has a love of historic preservation, which she put into some real action fairly recently. Christy started History Highways and Haunts, LLC, with Miranda Young, a.k.a. Ghost Biker which is headquartered in the Old Scott County Jail in Huntsville, Tennessee, a location both ladies manage and where they host tours, events, and ghost hunts. And their video podcast, Jailhouse Informant, is there as well. Please welcome Dr. Christy Sumner to the show. Yay! (laughs) How y'all doing tonight? We are doing fabulous. How about you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good. I know for Kelly and I, our favorite places to investigate have become these little county jails. So when we saw on Facebook (laughs) that you and Miranda had gotten your hands on the old Scott County Jail, we're like, we have a reason to go to Huntsville, Tennessee, for sure. We definitely want to come visit you guys. Love to have you share a little bit about the history there, 
how you guys got involved with it and with the things you have to offer there, the hauntings you have going on. We're just going to let you go and let us know about this place. <laughs> well, this is actually a very interesting place. And, and the, the reason we, we got involved with this is, uh, you know, about four years ago, I met Miranda, Ghost Biker, um, from Ghost Biker Explorations. And um, I had been following her show and she had been following Soul Sisters. We, we really didn't know it. But after her first season, I sent her an email and I said, hey, congratulations on your season. Best of luck. In the, in the next year. And so we started this email dialogue and we became fast friends. And so we started doing some collaboration investigations together. And we found out that we really had similar styles, right? She's very much into historic preservation and telling that historical story a- as we are. And so it really was one of those things where we just kind of jived. Since we met, we've always kind of talked about finding a location and really going into that location and preserving it historically, but also setting up a paranormal research center. A couple of years ago, her father passed. Scott County, which is where the jail is located, that's in her hometown. And so she started coming up to help, you know, her mom with some things and just kind of starting taking care of helping her mother. And so she said, listen, I've got to spend more time in Scott County, but there's this jail in in Huntsville in Scott County. It's sitting vacant. It, um, you know, nobody's been in it for years. Why don't we just ask the town if we can put our, our plan into action, right? And so we came up with a company called History Highways and Haunts um, because what we want to do is we want to not just be the jail, but we want to lead tours to haunted locations, motorcycle events. We want to really make this a robust company, um, not just for paranormal. We decided to get a, a business plan in place. We put together numbers and facts and figures, and we approached the town of Huntsville and said, listen, this is what we want to do this is what we think the outcome will be economically for the town. Um, will you allow us to do that? And they said, yes. And so here we are. We're in the jail. The jail was built in 1904. It was in operation as a jail until 2008. And then it said vacant until 2017 when the county of Scott County gave it to the town of Huntsville. And so Huntsville got a tourism grant to repaint and added some windows and added an air conditioning and heating system. And then it set vacant again from 2017 till 2021 when Miranda and I came in and and opened the museum. So what we really wanted to do was build a very robust crime and punishment museum, really highlighting Scott County crime, some interesting stories because Scott County people, they do crime right here. So we've got crime stories going on. Uh, We've got interesting artifacts in here, Um, you know, everything from uniforms to jail uniforms to officer uniforms to shanks and shivs. And and we really have collected those stories as well. We've got an audio tour that you can take. We really wanted the history to be the front runner in what we're doing. And then after dark, we've got our after dark tours. We've got ghost walks. We've got um, guided ghost hunts where you can come in and, and do a ghost hunt with Miranda and myself. And we've got private paranormal investigations where investigators can rent the jail for a night. Um, you get it from eight o'clock or eight thirty at night to three in the morning. Um, and I've got to say, when we first started, uh, you know, obviously, if you're opening a business like this, you're hoping and praying, please let there be spirit activity, just something. <laughs> um, and this has exceeded expectations. Uh, we everything from disembodied voices to full bodied apparitions to objects coming off the wall, whistling, humming has become very prevalent. As I said, door slamming, and it, it, it's any time of the day, right? You can be sitting here at 9am and you'll hear footsteps start walking up above you or some man will start humming in your ear. Uh, And it is, it's really probably the most intelligent location that I've been associated with that I've been in, because you ask a question, an intelligent response will happen. Uh, And and it's just one of those things that, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated on a daily basis of what we've come up with here. That is so cool. I wanted to ask too, because I don't know exactly how the jail is set up, but I know some of the county jails here, they had like, half of it was the warden's house and then half of it was the jail. Is it kind of set up the same way there? It is not now. It was when it was built in 1904. So up in, from 1904 up until the mid 1960s, the jailer did live here. So the room that I'm in right now, which was the book, which is now the booking room, um, it, this was part of the living room. And right across the hallway there, that was the jailer's quarters. 
There was a kitchen where the jailer's wife would routinely be the cook and she would cook for the inmates, um, for the deputies and, and anybody associated with the jail. So they did live here for, like I said, up until about the 1960s. After the 1960s is when they kind of moved out and they made that a sheriff's office. So when you go in there now, you know, you'll see the big star and, and the linoleum on the floor. And so that they also used it as a women's cell because both men and women were housed here. So they used it as a women's self at one point, J- really just depending on the sheriff and the administration, th- the rooms changed um, uh, for, for various things. Um, the, there's a, a, a cell that's back here behind me um, that was used as an interrogation room at one point, but also the medical uh, room where, you know, you were hurt or whatever they, they, provide medical assistance there. And so, so it just kind of ranges. Um, but a lot, it's, it's really, as you go through it, there's just really layers of history, right? So you've got this room, it served this purpose up until this time, and then it just moved on. And, and th- there's so many interesting historical stories that have come out of this jail and out of this county. And it's, it's almost like the jail wants to tell those stories and wants us to know the proper history. So I'll give you one example. In 1933, there was a a guy by the name of Jerome Boyett, and he, just in a very general story, uh, he ended up murdering a uh, a sheriff in the neighboring town. And so he went on the run, and eventually, for various reasons, he turned himself in here at the jail. And so he was up on the third floor, and a mob came through the jail, and they beat the jailer, and they went upstairs, grabbed Jerome Boyett and another inmate named Harvey Winchester, took him out, and they lynched him. So there's actually been seven lynchings from this jail. So those that, that, that's the two most well-known, Harvey um, Jerome Boyett and Harvey Winchester. About two or three months ago, a gentleman here in the county wrote a book about that story. So he gave us an advanced copy of the book. And so Miranda and I were looking through it. This is on a Saturday. So we were looking through the book right before a paranormal investigation team had come in to do an investigation. So the book is a factual book written from a fictional character's standpoint. So the character's name is Anvil Clemens. And so we're just kind of thumbing through it. And I'm like, oh, this is, you know, interesting name, Anvil Clemens. So we throw the book down and forget about it, right? So the, the paranormal investigation team comes in. And they're, they're having a great night. They're getting a lot of stuff. And so in the room right next to me, which is where the front door is, they had a, uh, a novelist. And the novelist said, Anvil, Anvil, Anvil. They got Anvil three times on the novelist. And so they were a little intrigued by that. So when, um, when they were done with the investigation, Miranda was here. So they said, just a quick question. What does Anvil have to do with the jail? Anything? And she's like, well, it's funny you say that because we just got an advanced copy of this book and a character's name is Anvil in the book. And so she's like, well, I'll talk to the author. So the next day she called the author and said, why did you name that character Anvil? And because this happened. And he said he went white as a sheet. And he said the reason that he named the character Anvil is because when the mob came in to get Jerome Boyd, they beat the jailer so badly that somebody said it looked like he had been beaten by an anvil. So his nickname, yeah, his nickname for the rest of his life was Anvil. We never knew that. The only person who knew that was the author because it's his great, great grandfather. Oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. that is amazing. Yeah. So it literally, the jail told us that story. So, and, and now, I mean, that's a story that we share because it's, it's interesting that the, the jail has told us that story. That's really incredible. I love that. So we've had some interesting comparisons that we've done. What is your solitary confinement there? What is it uh, well, like? Well, we've got two of them, actually. So de- right behind me, right behind this wall right here, we've got two cells that were originally built as drunk tanks. And so if you were drunk and they didn't actually want to arrest you, they just wanted you to sleep it off, they'd throw you in there. One is complete cinder block with a big steel door, no windows, completely dark. The other one, it does have a window with the bars, obviously, but you know, you, you go in there. That also doubled as the solitary confinement cells. So if you were unruly on the max maximum security level, they would bring you down and throw you in there for however long by yourself. There's also up on the maximum security level, there is one cell that has one bed. It's the only cell that has one bed. And that was what they call administrative segregation. So that essentially was their solitary confinement. While it's close to another cell, so you can still kind of interact with with people, if you were let out of that cell, you were 
in the 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 um, what we call the bullpen by yourself and in that cell by yourself. Gotcha. And and that sounds actually much more pleasurable than most of the ones we've been <laughs> around and what we've seen, especially a squirrel cage that was barely even tall enough for you to stand inside. Yeah, wow. basically you just had to stand in it. Oh and it wow! Was, it could be and hours. the door would close up on you. Yeah. That's uh, I, not fun. No. No. I like always a- love these stories about the wards who had their houses there, you know, that lived <laughs> on the property because you think about it was always the wife who had to take care of all of the the cooking and the laundry and stuff like that. And I think most people know there was no indoor plumbing back in those earlier years. So you can only imagine not only are you having to probably hear all the activity that's going on over there, but then you're getting those smells that are coming through. And mm-hmm. it, it must have been really tough if you were married to the warden. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we we actually, on our audio tour, it's kind of interesting. So what we wanted to do was kind of have different stories told by different individuals. So one of the stories that we have in that, where that jailer's um, quarters were, we actually have the son of a, of a woman who was born in there telling us her story about how she was born inside the, the historic Scott County Jail. For the kitchen, we've got uh, our mayor, Dennis Jeffers. He's narrating the fact that his mother... Um, learn to cook biscuits and gravy there in the kitchen with the oh. with the jailer's wife. Wow. And so, you know, just those interesting tidbits. But, you know, as I said before, this is there's just so many stories about this jail from a historical standpoint that are so different than anything that I've I've ever heard before in my life. Right. I mean, in in our main museum room, we've got the story of three different car bombings. I haven't heard of a car bombing, you know, outside of Iraq, right? But we've got (laughs) stories of car bombings here in Scott County. Um, We've got stories of, you know, sheriffs that were corrupt and, you know, the family lineage and all of this. And so it's interesting when people come through the door and they say, oh, I'm I'm related to so-and-so, you know, you better not talk about this person because the the families are still feuding, right? It's a lot of Hatfield and McCoy situation going on here. (laughs) But otherwise, it, it's just, it's a fascinating building. You know, it's shaped like a little castle. As I said before, you go into each room and each one has a, it has a, just a different historical layer about it. You know, like I said, this one was the booking room, but at one point it was a cell. And then it was, I mean, before that, it was the uh, the living room for the jailers and, the, and his family. Uh, so just a lot of stories like that. It's, it's, it's a very cool jail. I know the listeners can hear like little bells going. And then people who are watching the video, we've seen the cat jump in every so often here. Has the cat reacted to anything in the jail that seems like it might be paranormal? Honestly, she has. There, the first couple of days we've had her, we had her, she would go, because you can only access the second and third floor by a stairwell in the back. So you've got to walk upstairs. And so the first couple of nights we had her, um, she would come upstairs with us. And now she refuses to go up to the third floor. We had a team here last weekend and we kind of let her walk up with us. And she stood on that second floor landing and just meow, 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 meow. She just would not go up at all. So I actually had to come down and, and bring her back downstairs because she was almost like frozen there. We don't think anything is really messed with her down here. And we tell them, we tell the spirits, don't mess with our cat. She's here. Her name is Sally. Just pretty much leave her alone. So she seems to be pretty content, but she won't She won't go upstairs uh, to the third floor. And then on the second floor, depending on the day, she gets really mouthy. Sometimes she'll just walk up and, and just kind of walk around. And other days she'll just sit there and like she's having a conversation with somebody, meow, meow, meow. But otherwise, she's she seems to be pretty content here. <laughs> Do you feel like some of the spirits that are there have gotten to know you and Miranda because you guys are there so often? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we um, and and we get different interaction than a lot of teams do. And um, you know, we uh, we actually have a friend who's a psychic medium, and uh, so she actually did a FaceTime walkthrough with Miranda, and she was telling some different things, and and she said, okay, you know, they 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 know you're here. There's some that want it the way it was, and there are others that are really happy with what you're doing because you're telling their stories. We have a lot of articles around the walls of each of the cells, uh, basically newspaper articles. And um, they're, they highlight different things here that happen in Scott County. And we know that we we feel pretty confident. There's at least two spirits here that are associated with two of those stories on the walls. And um, I, I think that they're pretty happy that they're acknowledged in those stories. So that's kind of almost like trigger items, if you will. And so we'll be going up, you know, about our day and we'll hear different voices. I was opening up one Sunday morning 
I was on the third floor, which is our, our, it was, is our maximum security level. And um, so I was opening some of the windows about 10 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And I had a cup of coffee with me. And I said, uh, you know, good morning. Anybody want a cup of coffee? And a man's voice said, open your eyes. It was so loud. And I, I thought somebody had come in. And so I, I ran downstairs. Of course, the door was still shut. Nobody had come in. And it, I mean, it was just kind of one of those things that they kind of interacted with us. Miranda and I, there'd be numerous nights where we'll just say, hey, you want to stay and, and do an investigation? Sure. Yeah, no problem. And we'll go upstairs to our third floor, which is kind of interesting because we have several spirits who rela- who really react to religious music. And so you play Amazing Grace because we're we are literally the buckle of the Bible belt. I mean, the little tab on a buckle of a Bible belt. I mean, that's us. And so, um, you know, if you were in the jail on Saturday, your butt was in the, in the pews <laughs> on Sundays. But uh, so we actually had a sheriff in 1925. He was a, a Baptist preacher, but he was elected sheriff. And his name was Richard Ellis. And in 1925, he was killed right out here in front of the front door, ambush style. It's still an unsolved murder. So we do believe his spirit is here. And so when we go upstairs and we play Amazing Grace, specifically the pentatonic version, which is odd. Um, they love the pentatonic version of Amazing Grace. and when we I love play, it too. It's, they it's have a good song, taste. Right? It's a great song. So it was one of those things where we kind of, we kind of thought that religious music would elicit some response. So one afternoon we just started playing Amazing Grace and that was the one that popped up first. So I, we hit play and our K2s will go off, flashlights. It's unbelievable, the flashlight activity. There's one night where Miranda just put a, a ring of flashlights around the cell and they would just light up, boom, 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 boom. And they really seem to react to uh, smaller groups, but groups that are having fun. Uh, so there was one night where Miranda and I had three women with us here. They were actually the the mayor. Of, one of them was the mayor of the neighboring town, and and then the the historical director of the neighboring town. And so we we were just kind of cutting up and telling jokes, and everything was going off. And it was like they were really interested in interacting with us on that one. And uh, so I, I do believe that they they've gotten to know us. You know, different things will say or do will will cause a reaction, which is kind of fun. The one of the first pieces of uh, of evidence that we captured. This was the very first team that was here. Um, they did the investigation and they left. And during investigations, either Miranda or I are, are on site, right? Just in case something happens. And so we've got a little office over here. And so Miranda was coming from the office and she was coming into the booking room to put some paperwork away. And she heard a man humming. A, a, she said it's a very deep, rich hum. And it went on for about six seconds, which, as you know, in paranormal world, it's a long time. So it, it kind of froze her in her tracks. And so you see her, we have a security camera in that room, which is also our gift shop. And so you see her go back into the room to get her bag to leave. And we captured two voices on that that um, security camera. The first one said, there she is. And the second one said, not so loud next time, which I I think it's intelligent, right? They're saying, well, there she is. And the second one's like, dummy, don't hum so loud next time. She heard you. (laughs) So that was actually featured on WATE out of Knoxville. They came and did a story on the jail and on uh, the hauntings that we have here. And that, that EVP was featured. That was our very first piece of evidence. And that was when we were like, okay, she's haunted. Yep. We've, we've got activity here. Excellent. Can't ask for better than that. <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, we've like I said, we've captured shadow figures. We got a very compelling um, shadow figure in our drunk tank. Some friends of ours were investigating a couple weeks ago, and uh, one of our friends, Vicki Norris, who's a great investigator, um, she was here with uh, Sheila Brown and Sheila Holland and Nikki Wharf Edge. Great group of investigators, right? The drunk tank is also our working bathroom, right? It's the only one in the building. It's the, it's the only one we have here. And, and it's the one that has no windows, right? It's just the cinder block, the doors, you're in, you're in. So, you know, paranormal investigators, right? We have our voice recorders and we have them going all the time. And <laughs> so she went into the restroom and she didn't realize she really had her voice recorder going still. But, um, you know, you, you hear her in the bathroom doing whatever. And so as she's finishing up, the EVP actually blew me away. You, ha- you hear a man's voice saying, stand up, get out, let's go, get out of here. And I, when she sent it to me, <laughs> I, I said, I, I, I messaged her and I said, um, Vicki, I, I can't hear the EVP because I hear your husband. And she goes, my husband wasn't in there. She said, that voice is the EVP. Wow. I see, I, it blew my mind. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you guys. But it absolutely blew my mind. It, it's just, it's a great EVP. And it's something that a, a jailer would have said to an inmate in that cell. 
but it was it was just fascinating. One of the things that we're also doing here that is kind of interesting, we've never seen it done anywhere else, is we're actually um, undertaking a paranormal research study right now. And um, we have an item or items, we don't even know, that were given to us by a detective. And so the detective is actually in on this research study with us. So he put these this item or items in a container and he sealed it. And he's the only person that knows what is in that container. The only thing that he'll tell us is that it's related to a murder and it's related to the jail. And so we've, so what we do is we allow, it's not a haunted item. So what we're trying to see is if the jail will allow, will tell teams what it is, a date, a name, um, you know, what cell it was associated with. So we allow teams to come in and perform any experiment that they want with this item, whether it be dowsing rods, um, spirit box, um, K2 meters, whatever. The only thing is they can't record it with audio or video because we want to eliminate all bias, right? They have to sign a non-disclosure that when they leave here, they won't talk about it. They won't even tell anybody what the container looks like. So that re- eliminates all bias. You don't come in with a preconceived notion of what it is um, and you can't tell anybody. So it, it keeps that really that secretive aspect of it. So when they agree to participate, we'll take that item to whatever cell they think they want to investigate it in, or, and we'll move it. We'll put it anywhere you want. You can spend as much time with it as you want. Uh, and so then when you're investigating with it, you write down what you feel, what you smell, what you sense, what you hear, anything that is affecting you at that, po- at that point, you put it in a sealed envelope and you sign it. And we, you put it in a lockbox. And so at the end of the month, uh, de- the detective is going to open the lockbox and he's going to go through all of those and see if any team hit on what it was. So again, uh, trying to get the spirits of the jail to tell us, you know, what's in that item. I love that. That just sounds like a fantastic endeavor. I can't wait to hear how everything turns out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Uh, We've had a lot of teams participate. Now, there's some that don't want to, and that's fine. Um, You know, I I think some people come in and they think it's it's, it's a a test of their abilities, and that's not it at all. Um, You know, we've had some uh, psychics come in and say, no, I don't want to do that. I I, I think that's a, a parlor trick. And we're like, It's not, but it's your prerogative not to participate at all. So it's not, like I said, it's not a haunted item. It's just one thing kind of like Anvil, right? We want to see if the jail is intelligent enough to tell us what it is. What's cool about you having that location and being there as much as you are is it does give you the opportunity to do a lot of these different experiments and be able to do things over and over. Because when you only get a few hours in a place for like an overnight you only get a little bit of a taste and maybe you have a couple of things, a few things that might happen. But when you're there on a constant basis, it really gives you that opportunity. And plus, like you said, occasionally you guys will be like, oh, let's just do a little investigating tonight. So then you're like, oh, you could try something Mm -hmm. that you normally hadn't done before. So that's just really cool because it gives us that extra little bit of, even though I said, you know, earlier, we don't really feel like we need to prove anything to anybody. We still would like to have that kind of proof for people who are a little bit more skeptical and stuff to say, you know, this repeats itself or, you know, we get all this different interaction and then we find something out historically that lends credence to the evidence that we got. Oh, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. You know, and that's, that's really what we wanted to do with this building, right? Both Miranda and I, we want to make it a true paranormal research location um, where you can come in. It, it's not, it's, I, I mean, I'll flat out say it's not a big place, right? It, it's not a big location. It's not a Brushy Mountain. If you want a big penitentiary, go to Brushy Mountain. But this is a very intimate little jail that has a, what I consider a big paranormal punch. And if you come in and you listen and you really legitimately want to, to feel what's going on here, I think it's willing to tell you that. And so that's what's so cool about it. And and so to do something like this paranormal research study, and you know, subsequently we're going to do more in the future, to your point, Diane, that's really what we want to do, right? It's not to prove it to anybody per se, but it's to to really expound on the knowledge base that we have, right? Will the jail tell us something? Will the spirits here communicate with us on that level? And, uh, you know, to us, it's absolutely fascinating because we want to use as best we can the the research backgrounds, right? You know, anybody can go in and say, oh, well, this is, I'm going to sit here and do this. But to really bring a research element into it is a little bit different than anybody else is doing. Christy, this has been an amazing conversation. I'd love to end it with you sharing with listeners where they can find out more about you, Soul Sisters Paranormal, and of course, the jail. 
All right. Well, uh, you, if you want to know anything about Soul Sisters Paranormal, you can find us at www.soulsistersparanormal.com. We're also very active on Facebook under Soul Sisters Paranormal. And uh, our YouTube channel is Soul Sisters Paranormal. So all of our videos and investigation videos are there. Our landmark legends and lore are there. And then if you want to reach out to us, just go to that website, www.soulsistersparanormal.com. For the jail, um, the website is www.historicscott.com cojail.com uh, or again on Facebook it's historic Scott County jail.com and we're doing a lot of different things like I said we've got different tours uh, paranormal investigations you can do um, we have motorcycle events ghost walks so you know again again the history uh, the history of the jail is really cool in and of itself so historic Scott cojail.com or the historic Scott County jail on Facebook excellent So as you guys heard there, Christy mentions a couple of EVPs that they captured. And after the interview, she sent those over to us. And we're going to go ahead and share those with you guys right now. This first one is the EVP that Vicki Norris captured in their drunk tank when she was all alone. As you will recall, the drunk tank is also the bathroom. So she was in there doing her thing. (laughs) Yes, indeed. And here is what she got. We'll go ahead and play that one more time. So clearly, Kelly, that sounds like a guy hollering in the distance. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, that was amazing. But she didn't hear any of that with her ears. No. They heard it afterward when she was listening back to the EVP. You can imagine they probably jumped out of their skin because... That is a lot of EVP right around that, boom, same area there. Here's what they think it sounds like is being said. Get out now, let's go. Then stand up and then get out the door. Now, if I was using the restroom, a man yelling stand up is the last thing I'd want to hear. <laughs> I know. He'd be like, uh, I'm still peeing. <laughs> Might be a mess. We'll go ahead and play it one more time. And let's see if you guys hear get out now, let's go, stand up and get out the door. Yeah, so I think it probably is one of the jailers hollering at some of the inmates. I would imagine so. And it's so darn clear. It's really easy to hear that. You definitely get a feeling that a lot of the stuff that's going on in this jail is residual. Yeah, very much so. Now, the second is the EVP that they captured on their security camera in their gift shop. And we've amplified it so you can hear it a little bit more easily because of the podcast. It's hard to hear EVPs. So hopefully you can hear this. And we'll play it one more time. She sent these to me as actual video, so I'll put these up on TikTok and on Instagram so you guys can watch them. This is Miranda walking into the gift shop. She's not making any noise. Definitely sounds like a male. And they think it's saying not so loud next time. And that's when I think Christy had said that there'd been some humming that they'd heard audibly or whistling or something. Oh, interesting. So it was almost like one spirit was saying to the other, not so loud next time they heard us. Right. Based on what Dr. Christy Sumner shared about the jail, it seems that something unexplained is going on here. Is the historic Scott County Jail haunted? That That is for you you to decide. decide. Well, we definitely are going to be making our way up there. And if you guys didn't catch our interview for the Paranormal Conversations with Dr. Christy Sumner, make sure you listen to that one. They have investigated a lot of great places and gotten a lot of great evidence. This is true. And yeah, that was number eight, correct? It was. Okay. And since I was sick, we didn't have a Paranormal Conversations this week either. I'm trying to minimize how much my awful voice is out there. (laughs) People understand it's not unusual when people catch colds that their voice kind of goes kaput. (laughs) Yes. And this has been a hell of a year. This is my second one this year. I went three years without one and then I've just been getting them like every six months. You need more vitamin C. I guess. 
What we need more of is you guys giving us suggestions or telling us about experiences that you've had so that we can share them with other people. You can send those to historyghostbump at gmail.com. Yep, we absolutely love hearing your stories. We love to get feedback there as well. And you can give us feedback on any of our social media avenues. And we'd also love to have you check out our website at historyghostbump.com. We want to thank Savannah for her email. I finally got caught up on all the episodes of the show. And can I say, oh, my God, please don't stop making the show. As a kid, I never did well in history class. But the more I listened to the podcast, the more I started to fall in love with history. It's such a fun twist to history, and I can't get enough. You ladies do such an amazing job, are so educational, and yet so much fun to listen to. And so we just wanted to thank you, Savannah, for letting us know that you're enjoying it. And that is my main goal, is to get people so that they're back to loving history. Absolutely. And thank you for those kind words. And also, if you guys want to become a more integral part of the podcast, you can become an executive producer. History Goes Bump is an independent podcast that's made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. So if you'd like to help out, please join the executive producers where, for the price of a cup of coffee, you can get weekly bonus episodes with access to over 250 back cataloged bonus casts, ad-free early released episodes, plus other goodies at various tiers. And everybody gets a sticker. Check out patreon.com forward slash history goes bump. Want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Don't get a cold like me. No, definitely not. Bye bye. -bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the cemetery Laura Browder. You're going to be buried under an obelisk tombstone. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really could not afford to do this show without our executive producers. Want to keep the spooks away? Give us a review. There's a factory worker who spent 50 years of his life filling a garden with other worldly. Shortly thereafter, their first untethered man flight sailed over Paris for 5.5 miles in about 25 minutes. I know you would definitely want to take a flight in a hot air balloon, right? Yeah, I won't even do that today. I definitely wouldn't have been doing it back then. (laughs) Crazy people. The historic county. Nope. (laughs) Jesus. In 2018, the town of Huntsville received a $50,000 tourism in tourism. (laughs) Hey, it's back again. (laughs) 